We've heard all about Baltimore City's money problems, how the city can't afford to put more officers on the streets, etc., etc. So why is the city doling out $350,000 to spruce up Memorial Stadium? Keep in mind, they're thinking of tearing Memorial Stadium down. As Frank Graff reports tonight, even those who live around the stadium are wondering why. The city may still be debating what to do with Memorial Stadium, but they've decided the grounds weren't as green as it should be. So the city is landscaping the entire stadium lot. New trees, new sod, a water hose, snakes from a fire hydrant to a makeshift greenhouse in the parking lot. All those trees will grace the grounds too. 303 trees, four different species, and 4,000 shrubs, five different species. And it's not just the front of the stadium that's getting a facelift. Plans call for new fencing, new sod, new sidewalks, trees, shrubs, and landscaping across the stadium's front, across the street at Eastern High School, and around the entire block of the stadium. Total cost, $350,000. Jerry Perkins and his daughter Carrie live near the stadium. They like the new look, but wonder why all the money is being spent by a city strapped for cash. I think uh, it's, it's good for the, the uh, community, for the area. It makes the uh, area look uh, a little better. It spruces up a little bit. Does it make you wonder what they're going to do with the Eastern and the stadium? I think that's a big question with a lot of the people that uh, live here. You know, they're trying to figure out what's going on. It might be so many um, different sports teams that Baltimore's trying to get. Who knows? Maybe they're not going to tear it down. So why all the landscaping? Well, city officials say the trees are permanent part of the long-term plans for the stadium site. It also keeps Mayor Schmoke's promise to the neighborhood not to let the place fall apart. And the fact the All-Star game is coming doesn't hurt either. In Waverly, Frank Graff, WBAL, TV 11 News. This is Baltimore, America's sixth largest city, 12th largest metropolitan area, home of more than a million and a half people, site of the nation's biggest steel rolling plant, Home for the House of McCormick, this country's biggest tea and spice house. America's second seaport. This is Baltimore. This old film narrated by Keith McBee back in the late 50s is titled, This is Baltimore. The statistics and numbers are different now, but some things have remained the same over the years. However, for the most part, Baltimore has been a city of change. You're not native to the area. This is the Baltimore you probably have known. The Baltimore travelers used to see passing through the city on the main arteries of routes 1 and 40. Today, of course, the main route through Baltimore takes the traveler to the outskirts of the city, then through the new exciting Harbor Tunnel. It's cut 40 minutes off north-south travel time. Let's look at the real Baltimore, a city of homes growing so fast that today's cornfield is tomorrow's new neighborhood of young, energetic families. Families that benefited from Baltimore's diversified industry that provided jobs for a workforce of over three quarters of a million people. But of course, Baltimore was, first and foremost, a seaport. A big seaport that stretches for 46 miles along the Patapsco River and the upper reaches of the Chesapeake Bay. Baltimore is an inland port, close to the nation's densely populated heavy industry areas. An asset which attracts millions of tons of both foreign and domestic shipping each year to the port of Baltimore. And the very same waters of this port, believe it or not, provided Baltimoreans with one of their favorite meals then. And now, steamed crabs. Like I said before, some things haven't changed at all. the mayor may revamp security in all city high schools. Eyewitness News has learned that Mayor Schmoke is hiring a consultant to check the feasibility of installing security alarms in all high schools. Under the plans, alarms would be installed inside and rear doors of the schools. The mayor is said to favor alarms over hiring an additional 25 guards who he feels will do little to improve school security. And there is also the perplexing problem facing some city schools that could be forced to give back much needed funds. David Murphy reports the problem centers around a new plan to divide $32 million. Change that one, right. Andre Jones is a bonus to the kids at Armistead Elementary School. Andre is a math tutor, an extra teacher who helps them score higher, learn more, and even help check papers. It gives them some responsibility. 
Mm -hmm. That's pretty good. And how are they doing today? Oh, they're excellent. I have a lot of high scores today. Tutors like Andre are made possible by a federal program called Chapter One. Chapter One also pays for pre-K classes and outreach programs that help parents teach their kids. All of this is aimed at reading and math in schools that don't usually get any extra money. A good idea, right? It turns out it may be too good of an idea. We do know that many of our schools will need to be in program improvement, which means they have to change their program so that more of the boys and girls will achieve the reading and math levels that the federal government has set for us. Dr. Boston says the Chapter 1 money is being given to so many schools that it may not be doing enough good. Some students are still scoring low, and now some higher scoring schools may have to give up their Chapter 1 money to help out. And that means giving up things like Andre. But while some people worry about what cuts in Chapter 1 would do to elementary school students like this, the people at the Baltimore City Schools claim they already spread their Chapter 1 funds farther than most other districts. The problem is, if Chapter 1 students don't start doing better soon, there's a danger the city may lose $32 million in Chapter 1 money. But which schools will have to give up the most has some parents anxious. If they're going to take away the tutors, you know, what's going to happen what to the other kids? Are they going to end up re repeating grades? No one knows yet where changes will be made or when they'll be announced, but some are already counting down the days. One, two, three. David Murphy, Channel 13, Eyewitness News. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Baltimore of the 50s. Our city, to most observers, was in disrepair and needed major revitalization. The narrator of this old focal point documentary, Mr. Bob Jones, put it like this. Once a city known for its charm, its culture, Baltimore seemed now to hold attraction for no one. Broadway plays which had come here for tryouts didn't even come here to close. But a different kind of culture flourished. Why stay in a city which lacked business, lacked culture, lacked recreation facilities? Why live in a city withering in decay? Why bother about Baltimore at all? It really didn't seem all that bad to me, but folks in charge with an eye on the future knew something had to be done. Meet Bill Boucher one of our city's top movers and shakers, and back then, director of the Greater Baltimore Committee. In late 1956, the Planning Council of the Greater Baltimore Committee was formed to provide the programs aimed at getting decent rapid transit, new highways and expressways, adequate social and cultural opportunities, adequate in-town living areas, and a plan for the Central Business District. Whether or not those folks succeeded in all that will probably be the topic of another Now and Then segment. But really, all you have to do is travel downtown and take a look. There have been some changes made. And those of us who remember the way it used to be can appreciate what Baltimore has become. Let's just spread it out. Let's just spread it out across. By 8 this morning, Morgan students formed a human chain, trying to keep the class boycott alive. Sometimes it worked. There you go. That's right. Sometimes it didn't. This after a weekend session when school administrators said, get back to class or get no spring break. Morgan administrators say they're prepared to act on that ultimatum, though they haven't canceled spring break just yet. How did you feel about that when they said if we didn't go back to class at 8 o'clock this morning, there would be no spring break? Was you thinking, well, I'm going to class? No, no. I'm, I don't mind um, not having a spring break. It's, you know, I have no opposition with that. Like I said, some of us want to go to class. A lot of these students will tell you the upcoming midterms are what will get them into graduate school. To know the material, they have to go to class. That's hard to do when your teachers support the boycott. They canceled them. My teacher, my teacher believes he believes that what the students are doing is right, and I, you know, I'm, I'm behind the students 100. percent Of course, I'm one, so I, I feel as I belong with my brothers and sisters. But um, the issues are very prevalent. But 
You know, it's, it, we're hurting ourselves when I go to class. Off camera, we talked to a lot of frustrated professors who spent their class time talking about the boycott. They say, what good does it do to have class when only a quarter of your students are there in the first place? Maybe not stronger test scores, but stronger tensions in an already tense situation. Lowell Dayo, Channel 13, Eyewitness News. We all know it's too good to last. We know it in our wintry bones. So while the sun shines, we surrender to sudden summer and 90 degree temperatures. Is it hard to uh, come, you know, contemplate going back to the office today? I'm not going back. <laughs> You're not? Nope, this is it. Brought my work with me. <laughs> with temperatures 30 degrees warmer than usual for March, it was hard to find shade for all the people out walking around. For some still wrapped inside their winter coats, summer temperatures hit like a sneak attack. You're the only woman on this entire walkway wearing a coat. <laughs> <laughs> well, the weather's changing too fast, so I'm going to slowly but surely, I guess I'll break into the warm weather. But better safe than sorry. Maybe tomorrow if it keeps up. But restaurants with outdoor tables didn't have to look twice at the thermometer to know it was time to roll back winter. And with the weather, you know, possibly, you know, brightening up, it, it looks pretty it looks pretty profitable and I'm, I'm glad to see it. I'm looking forward to it. Paddle boats also did a good business while those who get paid for minding it deserted boardrooms and offices. You supposed to be out here? No. <laughs> Where are you supposed to be? I'm going right back to my desk. <laughs> but for a little while, desks and work could be forgotten, but only a little while. I suppose I'll struggle back like I'm supposed to and be a good, dutiful employee. That's very noble. <laughs> Thank you, I try to be. <laughs> After all, it's hard to be noble when there are ice cream cones and a sudden summer to savor. Alex Dimitri, Channel 13, Eyewitness News.